Yeah, absolutely. I think that's also something I really learned. You already said it in the beginning, but I didn't re really realize at that time, like it, it never stops all the time. Your, <laughs> your narrative is evol <laughs> evolving and, and you can keep making it better. You keep iterating, you keep, you keep uh, adjusting to the customer feedback you get. And yeah, yeah. we are super happy with it. And, and to give you a number, we have tripled in our MRR since uh, since we started uh, a year ago. So yeah, we're very happy happy with that. So we, oh uh, we God, love the strategic awesome. narrative. Okay, so when it comes to growing your SaaS business, there's essentially two ways to do this. Let me explain. So this is your company, right? And you sell an amazing SaaS product. This is your ICP right here. And all these potential customers don't know about it yet. My favorite definitions of marketing and sales is when you are running a proper go-to-market strategy, more people know about you and what you guys do every single day than the day before. And when we talk about go-to-market in this channel, and we've got so many videos on go-to-market, when I work with SaaS founders to drive growth and build a go-to-market strategy, basically we're figuring out how do we get more people to know about this SaaS business and this product and this transformation that you're bringing into the market every single day. When you are doing this, there's essentially two key ways you can actually get these people, your ICP, to find out about your SaaS product. The first one is direct. Direct is what we typically think about when we think about a go-to-market strategy. Direct includes doing blog posts. Direct includes doing content marketing, doing outbound, running advertising. That's direct. You build out your marketing capabilities and your sales capabilities. You build out all those capabilities in the teams to actually attract more and more people in your ICP into your SaaS product to acquire them as customers. Now, the second way you can do this is to go indirect, otherwise known as channels. And channels are super, super interesting, super, super attractive because the way they work is, turns out there's already a set of SaaS businesses or companies or agencies, whatever you call it, companies essentially, that are already selling to your ICP. They're already selling to them. They already have their own sales teams, their marketing teams. They have entire large organizations. This could be public companies. This could be large companies, you name it they already have built out their own direct channels to sell to this ICP. And when you actually leverage one of these channels, you essentially go as a SaaS company to one of these people, these channels, and say, hey, we have a complimentary product. We would love to partner with you and use your direct sales and marketing channels to sell our product. And in exchange, we'll do a revenue share, we'll do a referral fee, we'll give you whatever it is. We'll actually make it beneficial where at that point, you don't have to build out your own sales and marketing capabilities. What you can do is just go through them. So that's the attractive part about having a channel. Now there's a trick to this. When you are an early stage company, you haven't quite proven out your muscles yet. So these channels may not always trust you. They may not say, yeah, sure, we'll introduce you to all of our customers. You're awesome. They don't know you yet. You haven't proven yourself yet. And there's this balance, right? There's this balance of when do we do direct? How do we do direct? How do we actually do this with limited funds and constrained teams and founder-led sales and marketing? And when and how do we do channels and partnerships? Now, it's not impossible. When you are an early stage company, you can do direct, and we talk a lot about that over here, but you can also do channels, and sometimes channels work incredibly well. But there's a trick to this, and you have to approach it in the right way. So over the past year, inside of my go-to-market program, my coaching program where I work with SaaS founders like you to accelerate your growth, I've been working with Rick Vandenbosch. And he's the CEO of a SaaS product called Chanext. It's actually a platform. And what they do is help SaaS companies be more effective. And it's not just SaaS companies, just companies in general, be more effective in channels actually mobilizing channels and mobilizing partnerships. And they have customers of all sizes, of larger sizes, but also some smaller companies. But the cool part is they themselves are also an early stage company. And so as they worked through the go-to-market program, as I worked with them over the past year, they have 3 x their MRR. And Rick is awesome. And the reason I love him is because he's one of the smartest people I know when it comes to channels and partnerships. And it's not just him, it's his entire team. Even though they're so great at channels and partnerships, what they realized early on was they had to get direct right. So over the past year, they figured out how to do direct, they figured out how to leverage channels, and they figured out how to 3x their MRR. 
And so I figured it'd be really good to get on a call with him and share all the lessons learned, what worked, what didn't work, how he balanced a direct and channels, and how he actually got to the success that he's realized for his company over the past year. So in this episode, I'm gonna dig into with Rick exactly how to think about direct and how to think about channels and partnerships so that you know the exact principles to accelerate the path to the next stage of growth for your SaaS business. Intro. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Unstoppable. I'm TK, and on this channel, I help SaaS founders like you grow your SaaS business faster with an unstoppable strategy. Now, if you are new to this channel, welcome. I drop an episode like this with actionable strategies from the trenches on how to grow your SaaS business faster. So if you're new, be sure to hit the subscribe button and that bell icon. That way you'll get notified every single time I drop an episode with the TK energy. Now, if you're already part of this channel, if you're part of this incredible community of SaaS founders and SaaS leaders, if you're part of my SaaS go-to-market coaching programs, my people, welcome back. It's really great to see you over here. So here's the thing. While I work with so many SaaS founders on how to actually build out direct channels, how to build out your go-to-market strategy and accelerate the growth of your SaaS business, one thing is true. Direct is becoming harder than ever. To actually master key channels where you can generate demand, to actually be able to stand out and differentiate, to get organic growth without having to spend millions of marketing, it's becoming harder and harder. And when you're doing that, one of the things I'm constantly looking for is while we're building out direct, what are some unfair advantages that you can take advantage of so that you can rise above the competition, so you can differentiate. So you have these unfair ways of growing. And one of those ways is to actually use channels and partnerships. So in this video, I interview Rick Vandenbosch. I've been working with him and his team for the past year inside of my go-to-market coaching program. They've 3X their MRR. They're one of the smartest groups of people I know when it comes to channels and partnerships. And they also figured out direct, even though they knew how to do channels, because that's so important in the early stages. And as a founder, you might be wondering, how much stock do I put on partnerships and channels? How much stock do I put on direct? How do I balance the two? When is the right time to invest in one? How do I know? How do I think about channels? We cover all of these things in this episode as I get on a call with Rick. It's one of my most favorite episodes. He's also one of the, my most favorite founders because they just really apply everything we teach inside of the go-to-market program. So if you're excited to dig in into this interview and really dig into exactly how you can use partnerships and channels in union with Direct to get unfair advantages to grow, go ahead and smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm and let's bring in Rick and our conversation where we dig into exactly how he realized 3XMRR over the past year and how he unlocked the success for his go-to-market strategy. Also, if you're wondering how you can be part of my SaaS go-to-market coaching program, inside of this program, I actually help you develop your ICP, develop your manifesto, and run a Broadway show to drive growth and accelerate your growth. I'll drop a link below so you can check that out. You can get all the details around it. But right now, don't go anywhere. Smash that like button and let's go into the interview with Rick. What's up, everybody? Welcome to uh, another episode of SaaS and Scotch. Today, I have Rick Vandenbosch from Chen Next here today. He's the founder and the CEO. And we've been working together for nearly 14 months in the Go to Market program. So I'm super excited to have him over here. Rick, welcome to the show. Thank you, TKM. I'm uh, glad to be here today. Yeah, I'm super pumped. And you're in your new offices, you were saying, and with the cool view. Absolutely. We just moved to a new office uh, a few months ago. And uh, yeah, we're super happy with it. Maybe for the audience to set the context, let's take it from the top. I'm like, first, where are you located? Because you're not in the US, which is so, super awesome. And also, what does Chen Next do? What's the mission? Yeah, we are located in uh, in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, uh, pretty near Amsterdam. I think some more people will know that place probably uh, in the US. But what we do with Chen Next, we work for ICT vendors that sell their products via an indirect channel with partners. And what we do is we create software that help them to very easily launch marketing campaigns together with their partners. So with one click on the button, publish marketing campaigns to the websites, the social media profiles, and the digital advertising channels of partners. At one side, get away all of the hassle that it takes to do campaigns with your partners to 
together, but on the other side, also retrieve all the data. So you have one real-time dashboards over all your partners where you can see how they are, how your campaigns are performing, what partners are most active, which partners are most engaged. So that's uh, that's GenX in a, in a nutshell. That's awesome. You know, you and your co-founder are two of the most knowledgeable people I know when it comes to partnerships. And what I love about you guys is you didn't just wake up one morning and say, let's create a marketing platform for partners. Like there's deep experience and what makes partnerships work and what makes it not work. I want to cover two things for the audience. First, let's talk about partnerships. You're an early stage company. How do you view partnerships? And you serve a lot of really large companies that have huge partnership programs. How do you view partnerships for them? Let's talk about that. And then we'll talk a little bit around how the software helps and what, why it's important. I think partnerships are essential from an early stage. So for example, if, if I look at it from my own Chenex perspective, for example, we, we built the software so people can do marketing campaigns in a very effective way. But vendors and, and customers also really need help with creating the creatives and, and having great campaigns that actually convert. Because we always like to say like, we built the infrastructure, but it's what you send over the infrastructure eventually that will give you the results that you want. And I think that from that perspective, it's you really need to look at it from your own business, like what kind of model do you have? Where do you want to focus on? At, at the beginning, we tried to, to do a combination. So be an agency and build a software product, which was uh, pretty hard to be uh, to be honest. So at the moment, we decided to split it up. So if our, if our customers want to do specific campaigns, demand generation, leads, we are actually building our own partnership channel as well with other agencies that can really help the vendors in what they are really good at. So creating cool, uh, cool campaigns, make sure that they convert well and that they drive the revenue that eventually uh, you want to uh, to generate together with your partner. That's from my uh, my Genex perspective for a smaller company. You see the larger it gets, most of the people really look at it from up scalability as well. Because it, it, it becomes so much more scalable if you do it with a lot of partners. And it is really important to give them the right attention because just recruiting partners is not uh, going to automatically give you the results you're looking for. But I think also the larger vendors we, we do it with in the ICT space, uh, you really see that the they need partners to do the implementation of, of software to help them to influence a deal, to help them to, to generate the results and, and make sure that customer retention is good as well. That part where you said just the partnership isn't enough it resonates so much with me. This is what I learned. Like I ran the alliances and partnerships organization at Marketo. That was when I first started learning about partnerships. I learned a lot more having worked with you guys, but the, I learned a ton. I had a $40 million number and my predecessor was no longer with the company. I took over that organization. And I was like, what is going on? Like they have this, we have this huge budget. We have all these people. We have these partners who apparently want business from us, but we're not making any money. No one's making any money. <laughs> uh, and I learned that there are two kinds of partner orgs and partnership leaders, ones that get fired and ones that don't. And the difference was the partnership organizations that married doing the partnership with marketing created pipeline and created revenues. And the ones that didn't just got fired a year later because the partnership didn't turn into anything. And I know that sounds obvious, but I bet like early stage companies don't realize that like you have to marry marketing with partnerships and mobilize the partners. Otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah, I fully agree. I think that's super important. We see that there's, we call it the partner engagement gap. So when you when you want to start a partnership channel or even for the ones who have a very big one, a lot of your resources go into recruiting partners. So you want to recruit new partners, you want to create more partnerships, more relationships and in, in the hope that you will get a bigger reach. But if you forget to put in the work that's needed once the, the contract with your partner is arranged, that, that's where it actually starts. So you need to do co-marketing, co-selling, co-innovating. And right. I think that's that's where you want to put your resources because that's what will make your partnership successful eventually. And yep. yeah, it's super important that marketing plays a big role in that indeed because you partners need help to get your message. There's nobody who can tell your message better than you, yeah. especially if you've, uh, if you've worked with you. <laughs> but I think that's where you really need to help your partner. So how do you make help them to get your message to the market eventually and show them that there is demand for your product? Because I think that's the best way to work with partners is show them 
that there is demand for it instead of asking them like, do you have another lead or can we work on on a deal uh, together? Yeah, and that's where the that's where the trap is, right? Because you'll do a partnership and you'll say, okay, we'll do some marketing, but then you're now beholden to the marketing org on the other side using your assets to maybe run a campaign and maybe they do it, maybe they don't, but they have 50 other things. And I think that's where your platform really shines, right? You can engage the partners and really push through that channel and say, no, here's the campaign we're going to run and here are the assets and let's go do it. Yeah, absolutely. We turned it around. So a little bit of background for myself. I, I got the, my passion for the channel from my father. He yeah. worked in channel for more than 30 years. So at home all the time, I could hear, hear everybody talking about how to engage partners and is a partner portal the right way to get them engaged because we saw that partners are not really using them. And we thought, well, I thought at the moment with my co-founders together, I think that we are looking at it in the wrong way. Every vendor is investing millions of dollars in getting more partners to the portal. But what if we do look at it from another perspective where we say, let's focus on getting your portal to more partners or the content of your portal to more partners. I think that was the, the essence of, what, of the idea of Chenex, where we thought, what if we can rearrange this, where we create integrations with the systems of the partners, so with their websites, with the social media profiles and automate the process so that partners can automatically join in the campaigns instead of that they do need to do a lot of manual work for this. It's so interesting because there's some meta elements here. Like you are a company that enables companies to really mobilize their partnerships and their channels. But you as a company yourself, an early stage SaaS company, you have to figure out what are our partners and how do we do direct and how do we do our go to market? And you've been on this journey over the last 14 months building up the company. At least that's how long we've been working together. Let's talk a little bit around like top line. What's the growth been like for the company over the last 14 months since you joined the program and just with the company in terms of getting your getting all these pieces together and you go to market? I think where we really started together was, of course, working on the strategic narrative as well. And I think that was super good because it really helped you to think on a very deep level, like what is our strategy, not just in our sales pitch, but as a company, what is our mission? And I think how that really helped us was at a certain moment, we were like, what makes us unique? And that's that we put the partner experience first at all time, because eventually that's, that's what we realized. If no matter how beautiful the software you're going to build, if the partners are not into it, it's going to be worthless eventually. And that really helped us in everything where we thought, okay, we need to arrange our platform as well in the same way. So for example, a little bit more background from channel, most partners work with 15 to 30 vendors. All the vendors are, are battling for the same attention and every vendor has built their own po portal. So the partner needs to go there, they need to get it, but they are not doing it. So we thought if we want to put the partner experience first, we need to show this to the partner by giving them one hub where they can manage all their vendors at once instead of having it all separately from each other. And, and I think working on the strategic narrative helped us really realize that that is our strong point. It was our viewpoint from the first moment, but this together with the automation, because that's the only way that we can do the automation because most of the time partners are not waiting for another software platform, but because they can manage all their vendors in one platform, they want to connect. They want to connect their website. They want to connect their social. And it, I think it was really cool that we realized we need to put that forward way more. Also in our pitch to customers in our marketing, we are the partner marketplace eventually, like where they can manage everything within their hub. And at first we were quite maybe frightened to tell it. I don't know. Like also, of course, to the, to the mighty vendors and the big, the big logos we are working with. But now you see that everybody's really embracing it. And I had a beautiful conversation last week with, uh, with Alan Adler, who's writing a lot of interesting stuff about ecosystems and partnerships as well. And he said, you are democratizing partnerships. And I think that's eventually a super cool way to say it. Like if you take another mindset shift also from a vendor perspective and you're building your partnership in direct channel and you, you say, I just want to help you in the best way I can. And I know that you also work with other vendors and I don't mind. I just want to help you to grow. I think that's where the, the most beautiful partnerships will uh, arise eventually. Yeah. One of the, it's like a double-edged sword. You know so much about partnerships. You thought so deeply about it. It becomes hard to pull out and really think about, like, well, how do we craft this? And I remember there were some aha moments as we worked on the strategic narrative, the manifesto on like, oh, like this is the core macro trend. Like there's this gap and there's this wall people hit with partners. But if you put a platform in there, it can break right through it and get your assets to the other side and mobilize the camp. And I, I thought that was really cool. And you guys ran with it. There was a little bit of time, like we 
joined, we did a bunch of work. And then like, I didn't hear from you. And I like literally emailed you like, Hey man, are, is everything okay? And you were literally like, no, everything's great. Like we're, we have more business than we can handle. We might have to shift some <laughs> business model elements or growing. And then, and then like we iterated and we, we, we touch base as you continue to iterate on the narrative, as you continue to grow in the, in the last year. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's also something I really learned. You already said it in the beginning, but I didn't re really realize at that time, like it, it never stops all the time. Your, <laughs> your narrative is evol <laughs> evolving and, and you can keep making it better. You keep iterating, you keep adjusting to the customer feedback you get. And yeah, yeah. Well, we are super happy with it. And, and to give you a number, we have tripled in our MRR since, uh, since we started uh, a year ago. So yeah, we're very happy, happy with that. So we, oh uh, we God, love the strategic awesome. narrative. <laughs> that's amazing. I want to dig into some of the lessons learned. This is the, this is the thing I want to ask you because you are the perfect person to ask. You and I believe in partnerships. I run a partnership org. You run a partnership marketing platform. Like, like we believe in partnerships. We yeah. are also dealing with a lot of the, a lot of our audience that are listening is early stage founders, just like you, just like me. And so there's this balance, right? How much can an early stage company, your own go to market, Chan next go to market, rely on partnerships and how much do you have to do direct? And obviously you, you know, you double down on you know, running a Broadway show. You are super active now on LinkedIn. You just did a 30 day challenge posting on LinkedIn and your team runs a lot of direct activities to generate demand. And you said you're also doing partnerships. From your perspective, what have you learned about how much do you have to do direct how much have you do partnerships and how does that mix change as you continue to grow? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I, I think the most important part is you need to do it direct until you figure it, figured it out. Like not <laughs> entirely, of course, but like the, the basics. I, I think if we would have started with partnerships 18 months ago, it would be really hard because we were still iterating so much with your story, with your the way we market, the way we sell it to customers, even the way we like uh, report results to customers, like where's the value, what's the impact that we made. And I think if you haven't figured that part out yet, then it's it's really hard to already start with partners because then it's already difficult to have do it with your own team, right? <laughs> like, oh, sorry, the, the story is changing again, guys. But let, let alone with partners from, an, from other companies. I think really when you have the feeling like we have good traction now and, and, and the story, the, the narrative is resonating, I think. I think that's the time to really start thinking about, okay, how can we make this scalable? Can we create playbooks that partners can repeat this process? Can we help them? Can we support them with going to market? I think that's the moment when it's time to go all out on, uh, on partnerships. Yeah. That, that's that and that's coming from one of the smartest partners people i know rick and so thank god you're <laughs> thank saying you. that because i totally agree like i think that's right like you got to get it right because partners are accelerants right like they're like oh that's working cool we'll introduce you to a thousand of our customers and move it faster but they're not going to go experiment with you you have to earn the right and build the muscles yourself absolutely it's uh i always say show the partner that there is business in your co company like where the where the revenue flows attention goes yeah, <laughs> that should be on a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> so as you look ahead, you know, as you're thinking about, all right, we're going to continue to grow. You've three X your MRR. Well, in the next 12 months, are you now starting to turn on partners more now that you've kind of figured out like, okay, we know who we're selling to. The ICP is good. The manifest is good. You're running the Broadway show. Like how, how what does the next 12 months look like in this next stage of the journey? Because as you said, it does keep evolving and you have to keep iterating. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we are onboarding more agencies as well, indeed, to, uh, to ramp up that channel as well. I think for us, uh, a very good side effect of the strategic narrative that becomes better and better is also that the product decisions become easier every time. So over there, I also see some super cool results where they're coming back with a lot of cool ideas because it's so clear now what we want to achieve eventually. So I think that's also where we want to make some big steps. And we are working towards our Series A in the next quarter or early Q3. And uh, yeah, we hope to uh, triple again this year, but uh, let's see. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> when you think about go to market, it, you know, you don't, when you think about a manifesto or a strategic narrative and the clarity, not everyone immediately thinks about how it influences product or improves product. And you mentioned that more than once in, in this interview, it, like doing the work on the narrative helped you make better product decisions, helped you codify what should be in the product. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because that feels very powerful. And I, I think it's not obvious for founders as they're growing their companies. Yeah, I think I have a very clear example for that part. Uh, when we had our, our session in October, I think when we iterated our narrative, 
we put it a lot more towards data. So getting the, all the data from all your partners together in one place. And I think after that, we worked on it some more to make it more about the results. So it's, people don't want data. They want more scalable and predictable partnerships grow. I think that's the reason why they buy us and to make it easier to make it more scalable and see where it works. But once we figured that out, but people understand, that, okay, from our perspective, the thing we do, the impact we make is the scalable and predictable part for the vendors and the, and the partners together. But we do it with data. And since then, you really could see like that because they understood the narrative and they understood the goal that we are aiming for uh, to help our, our customers in the best way. They came with so many cool ideas as well. Like we called it channel intelligence. So partnerships intelligence where you, you could see market data. So what does the network of your partners look like? Not just what are they telling you, but what is it actually based on all kinds of data sources? And I didn't figure that out before. There were a lot of ideas coming from me, but now because they understand what the end goal is and our customers love it so that's if i think that's an example that where the narrative led to such a feature launch as well that's amazing do you think that the like the, the manifesto obviously helps go to market easier and execution easier all the way down to like what do we say what do we put on an ad do you think like it gives engineers and i'm asking i don't know if this is true or not did it give the engineers more clarity on oh this is why we're building what we're building or this is what our mission is like internally yes 100 percent I, I think especially in our market, like the channel or partnerships is pretty niche. Definitely yeah. within, within it's becoming a lot less niche, fortunately. I'm very happy about that. It's but becoming like, a thing. Like yeah, wholesaling partnerships is like everyone's seeking new channels because Facebook is saturated and LinkedIn saturated. So it's becoming a big macro trend for you guys. Yeah, I, lo I love that to, to see how big it's going to become. But like when I started four years ago at a birthday, something, yeah, you have a vendor and you have a distributor and a partner as well. And they all work together to get, it took you like already a long time before people understood that structure. And it's the same with it, with our team, of course, a lot of people who come to ChenX have, have, have never, especially in, in those type of roles, have worked in like a partnerships channel environment. Right. And, and this narrative really helps them to understand. They know, of course, yeah, data super important and they can think of how can we bring this back to the to the partnerships uh, ecosystem eventually that's one of the challenges as ceo right like i used to joke about it like at tout app i'm like no one wakes up in the morning excited about building sales software right like no one <laughs> like they don't know but that's part of our job to explain them they're like here's the big unlock we're doing for our customers and that's all get them excited and then they'll think more creatively so it's a big deal like that's a big job for the founder to get the internal team rallied around the mission and sometimes the narrative does that as well which is pretty cool yeah i fully agree with that I, I think it's actually the essential part to get everybody it's like a famous quote right the, the strategic narrative is the company strategy right. or I, I don't know know it exactly but uh, yeah i think I, 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 I believe in that part so rick i want to close off on this question you've had an incredible year partnerships are becoming an even bigger thing it's an important element important channel even beyond just direct aside from the narrative aside from the mechanics of go to market what was the one thing if any that was like the intangible thing that you really enjoyed about being in the go-to-market program over the last year? Yeah, I think definitely the sessions with you where we end like, you are already in your mind working on something so, so long, but then like having to, to having the ability to discuss it with someone and like get immediate feedback on it. I really like that. It, it helped help me forward. And uh, yeah, I, I also like the, the courses. So for example, something I didn't thought was in there at first, but like with the strategic uh, OKRs, et cetera, also helped me a lot to implement that in the company. So that's, that was another tangible thing that I, uh, that I liked about it. That's awesome. You know, I really enjoyed our sessions. I'm not just saying that because you said it, like I <laughs> felt like in our sessions, first of all, like your, your, between your time zone and mine, we always found like interesting times to connect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's now I have 7 a standard, for you, right? Yeah. We have so many <laughs> European CEOs and I have a standard slot at like 7 a.m. Like the sun is coming up now here in Dallas. Uh, that's why like the light has been coming up. But like, I really enjoyed our sessions because I felt like we did some really deep strategic thinking about like, okay, what is this? And what is this space? Because I think your category is super interesting because it's coming from like a secret to being like the thing that you have to do. I think whether it's 2022 or 2023, it's going to be the year of partnerships and channels in SaaS and in companies. I, I really enjoyed our sessions too, because I know that you deeply care about this and you deeply think about this. And that's always fun to like work with someone that does that. So I've enjoyed that too, truly. Yeah, thank you. And you are definitely right. I'm, I'm thinking about it all day long. Uh, <laughs> the best way to, to do partnerships. Uh, so uh, one last thing, we'll close out on this. 
you've three X to MRR, like you, you're continuing to grow, you're going after the next round of funding. What's the one piece of advice you'd give for early stage founders? What would you tell them when they're thinking about go to market? Like if you were looking back to you 14 months ago, 18 months ago, when you're starting in this journey, like what's the one piece of advice you would give them? Yeah, for me, like besides that we grew 3X, luckily we also had like a quarter where it went a little less like we wanted. And then eventually what we learned at first, me and my co-founder were doing all the sales, all the customer success. And yeah, we just did what we did, but we never really documented or created playbooks like, or we maybe even thought about it. What are we doing exactly? Uh-huh. And we really had this like little hiccup where it's like, oh, it's not working anymore. We had, we hired a lot of people and, and other people were taking over a lot of stuff as well. But if you haven't created the playbooks exactly the way you want it to be, you can never expect someone else to do it the way you did it. And I think that was my main learning from last year. Like this, that's something you need to do very well before you start handing over tasks to other people as well and, and hiring people to, to get it to the next level. You need to have it very clear for yourself, like what were we doing? That was bringing the success. And I think once we figured that out again, and we are doing it again now for, for a few months now, it's really back on the on the rocket ship again. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's funny. I don't think you guys have quite done this yet. A few of the other founders went through this from founder led to hiring teams. And I started getting emails like, can we just plug in our team to the course? And so now we have, as they're hiring, they're plugging in people to like, here's how you run the Broadway show. And here's the strategy behind it. Oh, super. Um, uh, we should do that for your team as you start to scale it as well. Like first you have to just own it. You're like, look, it has to be founder led sales, founder led marketing. Cause I don't think you can experiment and break through otherwise like you did. But then you're like, okay, we're hiring, but then it's gotta be systematized because they're not gonna be as good and as charismatic as founders are. So, but, so we have to like ramp them up in the right way with the right tools. So at least it's a common thing. It does happen to the best of us, but that's yeah. really good. Yeah, I, I heard it as well from a lot of other founders when I was uh, complaining when it yeah. wasn't working out. <laughs> Multiple founders will attest you guys should keep an eye out for it, for sure. Rick, this was awesome. I really appreciate you taking some time. It's been an honor to work together. I'm excited that you're joining Platinum. So we're gonna continue to work together. I'm so excited for Chan X. You guys deserve all the success you've had. And I'm excited for what you guys are going to be doing this year as well. So thank you for doing this. I know all the founders will get tons of value. Where can they go to find out more about Chan Next and to connect with you? What, what social media channel is the best for you? It's the best via LinkedIn. You can connect me uh, via Rick van den Bosch uh, from, uh, from Chan X or uh, go to our website, chanx.com. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm sharing about partnerships every day of the week. So uh, if you would like to learn some more, uh, definitely uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. He really is. He, he went into beast mode on doing a challenge <laughs> on LinkedIn and he, you, have, you have a lot of great content. So now, so thank you again for doing this. This is truly a pleasure. Thanks a lot, TK. I enjoyed it a lot. Now you know the golden principles that Rick and his team applied to 3X MRR over the past year and accelerate the growth of their SaaS business. So incredibly well that he was actually doing the interview with me in his new offices and they're going on for that next stage of funding, next stage of growth. It's incredible. So if you want to work with me to accelerate the growth of your SaaS business, then I invite you to check out my SaaS go-to-market coaching program. Inside of this program, I work on three key things. Number one, we actually flesh out your ideal customer profile. This is super important. Most people think they have it, but they don't really have it. So we're going to dig into that. Then we actually craft out what we call your manifesto. Your manifesto is your strategic narrative that really crystallizes the big transformation you're bringing into the world. It creates a lead magnet that you can use. It also clarifies exactly how to communicate the value proposition of what you're selling. And once you have those two things, you have a proper go-to-market strategy. Then you can use that and run a Broadway show that helps you make sure that more people know about your SaaS product and the transformation you're bringing every single day than they did before by running a consistent set of marketing and sales activities that drives growth. So if you're interested in working together and you're interested in learning more, just go to tkcater.com slash GTM, tkcater.com slash GTM. And inside of that page, you'll get all of the details. You'll be able to apply to join the program. We'll give you all the information and then we're off to the races. Also, part of this is you have to apply. The reason for this is we want to make sure that the right fit is there because the better the fit, the better the results. This is why we have companies with so many case studies that we've posted in this channel recently growing triple digits year over year, quarter over quarter, raising follow on rounds, getting to profitability. All these things are important. So we want to make sure the fit is right. So you'll get all the details on that page and then we can figure out if we can help you from there. Just go to tkcater.com slash GTM. Lastly, if you got value from this video, if you have a fellow founder, 
leader, a fellow team member, if you're part of a Slack group or WhatsApp group, please share this video with them. My team and I put a lot of love in these videos and we just mean the world to us to share it with others and we can serve the SaaS community in as big of a way as possible. Also, if you got value, please smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. It really likes it when you do that. Also, I drop an episode like this every single Sunday with actionable strategies from the trenches of building SaaS companies. This is not theory. I myself had built companies, scaled companies, exited companies over the last 15 years, and now I help other founders do it. And we report back from the trenches from actual things we're using to drive real growth. And so be sure to hit the subscribe button and that bell icon that way you'll get notified for every single episode. And lastly, remember, everyone needs a strategy for their life and their business. When you are with us, yours is going to be unstoppable. I'm TK, and I'll see you in the next episode.